We've started it. It's kind of a series, but not exactly. Uh, it's just the kind of some works of uh, A.W. Tozer. And if you want to see what A.W. Tozer looked like, look at this. I put a picture in the bullet. Okay? And his name was actually Aiden Wilson Tozer, and he was a... He passed away in like the 60s, and I think it's kind of funny that Aiden is not a popular name again. Uh, Aiden's a very popular name to avoid again, so those names do come back around. But uh, he was a, of a kind of a non denominational group, but he had some, uh, uh, said if you had, didn't remember, you weren't here. It was a very limited education. He had quit high school to help his family, and he worked at a tire factory. Or not a tire factory, he worked at a place repairing tires. And he was walking home one afternoon in uh, Ohio, somewhere, I can't remember, I think it was Akron maybe, and he heard a street corner preacher, and something struck him there, and so he went home and uh, got his Bible out and went up to the attic, and he converted to Christianity uh, kind of on his own. And if you remember, I uh, said he, uh, to not have a lot of education or anything, he, he had some of the deepest thoughts and the, the most sincere things. Uh, so we're going to kind of continue on with that today. Uh, and today's sermon is basically, Blessed are the poor in the spirit. And so this whole series, and it's a pretty long series, but it's a collection of things written by A.W. Tozer. And if you're familiar with uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, he did the same thing with like near Christianity and some of those kinds of things. Uh, so we're going to start with the, the, the scripture readings are from Genesis and then from Corinthians. And then we'll get into the, the meat of this. Genesis 22, 15 through 18. I'm sorry, Matthew 5, 3 first. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In Genesis 22, 15 through 18, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son and your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed, because you have obeyed me. <clears throat> and then 1 Corinthians 4. For you may, for who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did not receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? So we're going to tackle that first concept in Matthew there, and that's that poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And it's the first beatitude. You know what those are, the beatitudes? It's the very first beatitude, blessed are the poor. Okay? Now Luke, if you look in the book of Luke, it says blessed are the poor. If you look in the book of Matthew, it says blessed are the poor in spirit. It's two different concepts there, because blessed are the poor kind of means a little bit something different. So I did a little research, because I got kind of curious in what this really meant, and I found that the Dead Sea Scrolls, when they found those way back in 1930-something or 40 or whenever they found those, the actual Hebrew writing at that time said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. So we're going with that one. Okay? That's, that's an arbitrary decision, but that's the one we're going with. Because actually, I think that's what Tozer was talking about. And I don't know about you, but... To me, to be poor in spirit was kind of contradictory to what you hear from the rest of the Bible. Wouldn't you want to be rich in spirit? What a day that would be. Wouldn't you want to be rich in spirit instead of poor in spirit? <laughs> Don't we want to be, like, full of God and enthusiastic? You know? It always confused me. And A.W. Tozer finally kind of cleared up this little conundrum for me. And if you remember, Tozer was the guy that, that didn't even like, although his, his religion practiced it, uh, of being saved. He didn't really like that concept because he said, if you remember, to be saved, too many people say, I've been saved, and they go right back to doing exactly what they've done the rest of their life. So it truly didn't mean anything. It wasn't the religious conversion that it should be. It was just, I've been saved, and, and like, get out of hell free card, okay? And I'm, I'm good. Okay? Just like if you're playing Monopoly, get out of jail free. Okay? Anybody who ever watched Cheers, the older people, Years. If you remember when Carla, her son, decided to be a priest, and she said that if if, uh, if your son's a priest, you automatically get a you get out of hell free card. So she just treated everybody horrible, okay? And then he decided not to, and that changed everything. But that's kind of what Tozer's thought process on, on that is that it's not too easy. It's harder than that. Before God made man and put things on the earth, He first prepared the whole of creation. 
the Bible tells us that. He prepared everything. And there were plenty of things there made for man's use. And I thought, that's kind of like before you have a baby. You get your nursery ready, people give you showers, you buy all the stuff. You know, I still remember Grandpa and Grandma being really upset that the, the doctor didn't tell them they were having twins. They didn't know until Dad and his brother got here because they had prepared for one baby. And all of a sudden, there were two. And the doctor knew. He heard two targets, but he thought it'd be a good surprise. They didn't think it was such a good surprise. <laughs> <laughs> they, they then, in turn, did basically twice as much stuff more, that God prepared the world for us, okay, and for man, and everything that he prepared was kind of supposed to be external to man, it was not supposed to be something that we lavished in our heart or we, we had in our heart, that's where God was supposed to reside, but all these things were for God's, for, for man's use, but sin got introduced into the world, okay, <coughs> and things started taking the place of God in our heart. And still to this day, things fight for a place of God in our heart. The things we own and possess and so forth, they fight for a place in our heart with God. And it's a pretty accurate description if you think of people with spiritual trouble or a lot of spiritual trouble. It's that deep down in that heart, in your space, in your heart, you want to possess things. We covet things. Okay, oh, look at that brand new white suburban. Isn't that gorgeous? what I would give to have on those. Okay? Now that's my wife coveting the brand new white suburban. I get to pick on her. Okay? <laughs> Not until we put another one on that. Okay? We love, and think about this today, just think about this today, how many times we use the pronouns my and mine. Me, 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 me. As a matter of fact, when kids are real little, it's about me, 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 me. Mine, 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 mine. Okay? You no know, finding Dory. The finding Dory. No, it's a finding Nemo where he flops out of the deck and all the, all the birds are going, mine, 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 mine. They're going to eat. Uh, they're claiming it. The roots of our hearts have grown into things. It's told us it's the roots of our heart, instead of being in God, have grown into things. And things have become totally necessary to us. We do not think we can live without certain things. Okay? God's gift gifts that he gave us have taken the place of God himself. So all the things God has provided for us have kind of replaced God. And Luke 9, 23 says, Then he said to them, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. So within each of us is a little bit of an enemy, and that enemy's name is self. Self, selfish, selfishness. Sometimes we need to truly ask ourselves, and you're not going to like this question, but if all of your possessions were taken away today, would we still be alright? If everything we have, like Job, was washed away, would we still be alright? And the answer is yes. We may be inconvenienced, we may be sad, we may be sorrowful, we may not like it at all, but we'd still be all right. Some of you have known people whose house was destroyed by a tornado or whose house was destroyed by a fire and they thought it was the end of the world. But two or three years later, they look back and they're all right. My family's still here. We're still all right. The way to the deeper knowledge of God is through that pain and inconvenience sometimes. It's a poverty of the soul, the poor in spirit, that have learned that things are just things. Things are just things. They can't bury you with it. There's an old joke about some people standing around. A guy had a whole bunch of money, and one guy was standing at their buddy's grave, and one guy threw in a quarter. I just, just feel like doing that. Another guy threw in a hundred dollar bill. I like doing that for my buddy. And the other guy said, well, I'll talk. Yeah, I'll put in 500. Let me write you a check. <laughs> <laughs> because ultimately, when you throw it in, it, it's gone. When you're gone, your things are just somebody else's things. Trust me, we've cleaned out my parents' house, and some of you have too. Your things just become somebody else's things. That's all they do. 
So the way to get truly close to God is that poverty of spirit. Through freedom from all sense of possessing, they possess all things. I'm going to say that again. Through, through, for, to free yourself from all sense of possessing things, when you do that, you find out you really possess everything. Hard concept. I'm going to look at Abraham and Isaac for a minute. God talked to Abraham, made him some promises that I'm going to make you, your children, greater than the stars in the sky, the sand, the grains of sand on the sea, the whole bit. You're going to have, these people are going to have everything. And then he gave him one son in his old age, Isaac. And if you know that story, you know what's coming. Then God told him, take Isaac up on that mountain and sacrifice him. And you know Abraham had to be thinking, how am I going to have all these kids and all these descendants if I have to kill my only son? But Abraham went. Can you imagine the anguish that Abraham had of taking his only child, not only as a child, but the one that they waited so long for up on that mountain and standing there? And Tozer points something out that I thought was kind of interesting. He said, possibly that anguish anguish was not felt again until Jesus wrestled with the final moments of his life in the Garden of Gethsemane. I thought that was an interesting comparison. But that anguish was so great. Abraham had been promised all these things and now he had to sacrifice his son. But Abraham ended up not having to go through with it. God simply wanted him to understand that Isaac had taken God's place in his heart. But his own child had taken God's place in his heart. Now, I'm not saying there's not another part for your, your, for your son, but there's got to be a part for Isaac. Abraham, or Genesis 2, or 22, 15, and 18 says, The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from a heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you've done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. God made Abraham understand that despite the fact that he was very rich and he loved his son very much, he actually possessed nothing. Because whether we like it or not, we truly don't possess our children. They're related to us. But we truly don't possess that. And if that's the case, if you think you do, you haven't raised a teenager. Okay? <laughs> do you think after that whole experience that when Abraham said, my son, it meant something different to him? That my piece, my son, my son because he was given to We, kind of like Abraham, don't want to give up our treasures. We like our things. Believe me, we like our things. Try going through your house and deciding what you're giving away to charity. Or what you're going to get away with. We like our things. How many of you have, 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 have clothes in the closet that's probably hung there for three years? And you have, but there might come a day when I wear that. Well, you have in the last three years, probably not going to now. But, but, as a matter of fact, I put on a coat this morning. It, and I said, I better wear it today or I won't wear it all summer or all winter because I've got one of those long black winter coats. I used to wear it work a lot, but I don't wear it much anymore. I'm like, well, I better put it on now or I may not ever put it on this winter. And do what? Well, you can do that. <laughs> we got to realize that our gifts and our talents and all those things that we got are from God. We have, and Tozer points this out and it's interesting, we have no more right to claim our gifts and our talents than we have to be able to claim that we have blue eyes or blonde hair or red hair or can curl your tongue or anything else, and that's why I made Caitlin do that. Okay, so this would all come in because it's genetically passed down. We have no control over what color our eyes are. We have no control over what color our hair is. We have no control over, like Don and Annalise sitting here playing without a stitch of music. I'd love to be able to do that, but I can't, okay? I can't do that, but I can sing, okay? I said, I can sing, so i got a talent somewhere. Right? We've all gotten them, but we have no right to really claim them because they were given to us. And we have no more right to claim that as my talent 
than to say they're my blue eyes. Well, they were because it was passed down to you. One last scripture, 1 Corinthians 4. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And what did you receive? And, and if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they understand that all they really need to possess is God. And the hymnal to 754. So after we sing this hymn, we will uh, 